What's going on, everybody? Sean from Lumix Live here, and we're here for part two of the S5 Mark II series coverage, I want to put it this time. So uh, last week, we talked about the photography side of the S5 Mark II X and you know, how it kind of fits in place, why a photographer may be interested in the Mark II X, even though uh, I honestly, I feel a vast majority of you are probably going to be picking up the Mark II X as a video tool. Um, but there's a lot of things that the camera offers for photographers that are maybe a little more, you know, kind of deep down in there as far as why you'd want to pick one. And some of that also carries over into the video side of the camera. Now, while I can almost guarantee that the vast majority of you know the Lumix cameras because of the video functionality that we've offered, uh, there are a few things that we're doing in these cameras that, you know, I, I would argue is still considering, still considered a lesser known capability or at least a misunderstood capability. Uh, and that is primarily the ability to record in open gate. So, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the fact that with our cameras, we can record in a three by two aspect ratio, you know, kind of image at 6K. It's going to give you, you know, some vertical cropping, some punch in if you're doing 1080p delivery or 4K delivery. And all of that is is totally well and good. But there is also a very big part that a lot of people... I think are still missing, even though there are a lot of people in the, in the Facebook groups and forums that are, I would say, picking up on this point, and that is multi-aspect delivery. It's easy for a lot of us to kind of brush under the rug the idea of things like vertical video or 5x4 video or 4x5 video, uh, outputs that a client may be asking you for. And up until... You know, recently, and honestly, even still recently, with a lot of the accessories that you see being made for cameras and and cage accessories and stuff like that, you see that there is still this shift to hold the camera vertically. And while that can be a very valid way to still record content, we've really taken a lot of thought at how do you how do you take a capability that is known in a much higher end cinema sense, and that is the open gate recording, and apply it to situations where you never really would have necessarily thought about using them before. And that is the whole idea of being able to record once and deliver multiple aspects and not have to do multiple takes. So the reason, you know, I, I, I think this is such a big point is that when I look online and I see a lot of the commentary that people are making about the cameras, I see this day in and day out. I don't want to shoot vertical. Vertical is pointless. I wish vertical video would die. It's not a valid way. You can't get your creative, uh, you know, vision out as far as filmmaking and stuff like that. And while I can understand some of that logic, it's a relatively archaic view these days because the truth is, if you are producing content for a client, whether that is a wedding, an event, a corporate client, even if you're producing a major motion picture, these are all platforms that are having to be adapted in some way for vertical delivery because advertising is key. You can make the most beautiful piece in the world, but if people don't see it and you're not delivering content to where people are viewing it, you're never going to get traction these days. So with the S5 platform, um, and primarily in the S5 Mark II and the Mark II X, we have built in all of the tools you need to capture vertical video. Now, this can be done super, super easy in the sense that you as a filmmaker or as a videographer do not have to change a single thing about how you approach filming anything, an event, a portrait, you know, a, a, a wedding, whatever it is, you still film the camera like I'm filming right now. I'm using the open gate mode on this camera and I am filming in a standard way where I actually get a little bit more flexibility. You know, I don't have to make sure that I am sticking in 16 by nine in this particular frame. I know that I want to stay relatively within a, you know, kind of particular area, 
but I have flexibility to be able to move around a little bit more. I don't have to make sure that, you know, I am right up on my subject so that I'm cutting out everything else around the, the room. I know that like so is you can probably see because I'm going to cut to the full full three by two ratio here. I'm holding my microphone because it doesn't really fit well on this shirt. But I can, with the ability of just taking this open gate, putting it into my 16 by 9 crop, I have that ability to now just crop out where the microphone's coming up and just shift and slide the frame up and down. But what's even cooler is that unlike what everybody else has to do with all of the other cameras out there, if you're looking for a high quality deliverable, I don't have to shoot this whole thing twice. I shoot it once. I film this conversation, I talk, I explain, you know, what it is that we're doing, what we're talking about, and now I have a piece that I can deliver 4K in 16x9 for YouTube, my 9x16 for social media, I can even do a 4x5 or a 5x4 to maximize the amount of space that I'm going to utilize on Instagram or Facebook or whatever the platform is. It's all being done in one take. So enough rambling about this. Let's actually look at the camera and show you what this actually looks like, what it is that I'm seeing and how I'm framing it. Now, obviously I'm not going to be in the frame. We're going to be looking out the window here, actually at the Panasonic offices here in New York or in uh, New Jersey. And we're going to talk about some of the tools that we have in here, the frame guidelines, uh, how you select and go through these options. And hopefully at, by the end of this, you'll have a rough idea of how you can utilize OpenGate and the functionality that we offer in the S5 Mark II and the Mark II X to help bring your filmmaking experience and your content creation experience that much, make it that much easier on your life so that you're not having to spend so much time shooting, you can get that perfect take and then be able to go and make your deliverables. So let's take a look at the camera and go from there. All right, so we are taking a look here at the screen on my S5 Mark II X. And as you can see, we're recording in the 6K 420 10-bit long op 24P open gate option. And uh, excuse the... Uh, uh, kind of rudimentary setup here. You can see me looking behind the camera in the reflection. Uh, but the whole purpose here is to show you that with the camera, you're recording in the full image area. So I am looking at an entire 3 by 2 aspect ratio image that is going to be recorded by the camera. But also, I am looking at the general kind of flexibility that this is going to give me. Because if you think about the way this is being recorded right now, so I'm HDMI out into a capture device onto my laptop, I'm recording this in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which means that my 3 by 2 is actually being, you know, kind of crushed down into that aspect ratio. Well, if you think of this in the inverse way, you see that I'm actually recording much larger than what I would need for 16 by nine because the scaling would give you that flexibility for punch in. So what's cool about the way we've built this into the camera is that I have every bit of information that I need to record here. So I am literally recording in the full image area. But what's even cooler about this is that I have the ability to say, hey, I'm going to be shooting this and I know that my only deliverable is going to be 16 by 9. So I'm only doing a you know YouTube or a television or any kind of standard 16 by 9 aspect ratio. I have the ability to just put my frame markers on there. So I maintain that full image area but I also know where my safety area is going to be for recording that, you know, kind of higher end capability. So if I stop the recording here, what you'll see is that if I go menu and then go into the display settings, you'll see that we have this option down here called frame marker. And we've covered frame marker before, but specifically for what I've been using the camera for, you'll see I can go set, 
16 by 9 is the frame markers that I want to use. I have a frame color that I want to use that, in my opinion, is just easier to see for my eyes. And then I also have a frame mask on this camera. Now, what's cool with frame mask is that I have the ability to come in here and change this. So if I want to have every area that is outside of the uh, kind of area that I care about, I can have it totally blacked out so that you don't see anything out there. But if I want to know like, okay, you know, what kind of area do I have to play with? I can change the opacity here. So let's set this to 50% for this demonstration. So now once I have that set, I can come in here in a number of different ways. I can literally come into the menu and just turn this on, which means now when I half press the shutter, you see I have my frame markers. And what's cool is that you see that right below the two kind of ribbons of information, so where you see 709, the MOV, things like that, you see that that's about the area where you're going to have your 16 by 9 ratio. So if you're looking at the full sensor width and you don't want to use frame markers, you know that roughly as long as you keep your subject between the two information ribbons, uh, top and bottom, you're going to be pretty safe and know that you're in a 16 by 9 ratio. But we've added it into the camera. Now, in the entry of this uh, stream, you know, I talked about how this also gives you the flexibility to be able to say, hey, I want to shoot once, but I don't necessarily really want to worry too much about, you know, where my framing is. Now, I was center framed in that because for me, that's just easier. But if you want to do things like, you know, work on rule of thirds or keep your subject off to the side or whatever, you know now, okay, I have the the range that I need. And if I need to slide the frame up or down to accommodate, you know, maybe someone who's a little bit taller, someone's a little bit shorter, I'm totally set. If I have two people that I'm recording and they're of different heights, if you record everything at open gate, you can then just slide the frame and make sure, you know, if you want to keep them at the same height, stuff like that. But social media is the delivery that the vast majority of people are wanting now. Whether we like it or not, uh, it, it, it is what people request. It is what clients are requesting. They need a copy to be able to deliver. And a lot of times, if you are filming, you've got that like one perfect take that you love that you're probably not going to be able to re like recreate. And this happens a lot in weddings. You get that one perfect moment in a wedding and you're not really going to be able to recreate that or fake it just so that you can get that social media clip because the bride and groom want it. Well, if you record everything in open gate, you have that ability to say, hey, you know, I know that the first thing that, that the clients are going to want is they're going to want a uh, 9 by 16 because they're going to want to post it to their TikTok, their Instagram, their whatever it is. Well, I we built that into the camera. You've got the 9 by 16 aspect ratios here. So now I changed this to 9 by 16. They're on. Now I know that if I need a super fast turnaround, I can just make sure that my subject or my the action that I want to film is within the bounding boxes here. And if you're someone who really, you know, doesn't want to have too many distractions around there, this is where you can change the opacity. So say if I change this to 100%, there you go. It looks as though I'm recording only that 9x16 frame. But in reality, I am recording the full 3 by 2 aspect ratio of this image, knowing that this is the region of interest that I have for that particular clip. And it doesn't even really stop here. You know, as I said before... There's also a lot of situations where your client just wants to maximize social media in general. Well, that's what the 4x5 and the 5x4 aspect ratios are. 5x4 is the wide angle, quote unquote, wide angle aspect ratio that you get to maximize the height and width available in program, you know, in apps like Instagram for a horizontal aspect delivery. But if I want to be able to deliver in, you know, the highest, you know, kind of pixel density count for that, that particular output, I can change it to four by five and there's my vertical. So this, this really is designed because of the fact that all of us want to be able to show the highest quality possible product that we can. And we're, we're using these cameras, we're paying for the resolution, the frame rates, the bit rates, all of that stuff. And 
even if social media is going to be delivered in a quote-unquote lower resolution, and I say that because it's, yes, delivery is in that, but upload is a different thing, even if you know that it's only going to be 720 when it's out there, why not record in the higher resolution? Mobile devices are getting higher and higher in their native resolution. Friends and family still want to be able to see the highest end resolution. And the fact that there are people that are going to want to be able to not just take that video and show it on a TV. They're going to want to show it to their friends, to their family. And let's face it, the vast majority of the younger generation are used to holding their mobile devices in a vertical sense. Why not give the client something that is your high quality work, your you know style, but in a, in a deliverable that fits what that client wants and how they want to share it to their friends and family. And when it comes to corporate sense, vertical video is just the future. Whether we like it or not, vertical video is what is going to dominate the delivery of content, at least in the short form. And what I mean by short form is the like, you know, 30 second to minute and a half long content. That is what's going to dominate. If you want to be able to utilize the content that you're making that's going to live on YouTube, Vimeo, whatever, and you want to get more people to see it, you have to be able to deliver that content for your end users, for the people that you want to drive to your main pieces. So why not use the tools that you have? And the S5 Mark II and the Mark II X are pretty much the de facto cameras, in my opinion, to deliver that content to you. They're giving you the ability to record 6K. You have unlimited recording on these cameras. You don't have to worry about thermals or time limitations. You have a, an ultra high resolution camera. They have phase detect autofocus now. You can shoot everything in V-Log, grade it exactly how you want your end result to be, and know that that piece will look identical whether or not you've got it delivered on YouTube, on Vimeo, on a television display, but more importantly now, where people are consuming quick content to determine whether or not they want to move to something different. You can now deliver all of that content in vertical as well, but you don't have to make your life harder to do it. You don't have to change your style up for filming. You don't have to say, you know, hey, I'm going to film this in 16 by 9 and then I'm going to do a second take and I'm going to hold the camera vertical and well, maybe the content, you know, maybe the, the that particular take doesn't perfectly match. Maybe the, the you know, kind of commentary isn't exactly the same. Maybe the emotion isn't exactly the same that your, you know, your bride and groom or your, your, your couple had. Now you have the ability to record it once in higher resolution and have that piece of content that you know they're going to love. So, as I said, I, I fully think this is one of the more misunderstood pieces that we've got in the camera. People think open gate and we tend to only think of it in that really high end case in that I'm going to be able to shoot anamorphic. I'm going to be able to shoot you know, de-squeezed lenses. And while, yes, we do have all of that functionality here, we do have the anamorphic de-squeezes. So if you're, even if you're shooting an open gate, you can set your different de-squeeze. We even have the ability for things like safety zones and all of that stuff that it, it really does cater to that much higher end production. But I don't have to use these things specifically for those capabilities. I can use them in ways that make my life easier as a filmmaker or as a content creator. And I could tell you from Lumix Live, we've been using these, you know, shooting pretty much every piece that we do to camera that's not live. I've been doing them in open gate since about the GH6 when it made it actually that much easier for us. So I encourage you to take a look at it and, you know, kind of actually play around with this stuff. You know, the, we also get questions about, well, you know, okay, but it's, it's only 420, you know, chroma subsampling. Yeah, it's 10 bit, but 422 is better. And there is even thought process into why we use 420 10 bit instead of 422. So let's, let's have a conversation about some of those pieces and why we choose the different aspect ratios and things that we do in the cameras. All right. So as I mentioned, there are 
things that you kind of have to consider when it comes to bit rates and resolutions and the different combinations that are available in cameras. And while the S5 Mark II X is, is kind of our, what I would say current top of the line as far as full frame cameras go for the various different combinations of these capabilities, there are certain things that you want to keep in mind as far as your workflow side when it comes to which one to choose. Now, the most common capable uh, recording option that's available is the H.264 compression. Um, if you want to maximize the capabilities in the S5 platform, you're going to be recording an MOV. That's going to get you 422 chroma subsampling. It's going to get you 10-bit capabilities. And depending on which camera you have, if you're on an S5 Mark II, you do all of that in long GOP or IPB. Uh, if you're in the S5 Mark II X, that means that you can do this in all intra. Uh, but you also have another level of control in the S5 Mark II X, and that is the ability to record ProRes. Uh, now, the 422 chroma subsampling is awesome. It's great especially when it's in an H.264 compression because that is a much more commonly hardware decodable uh, format for whether or not you're working on a Windows or a Mac-based solution. Now, a lot of this is kind of starting to become in flux these days because the more the M1, the M, I think it's an M2 now, whatever it is, they have the ability to do more than just kind of the basic H.264 decoding and they make it a little more streamlined, which is great, but it is still a relatively small portion of the hardware being utilized in the market compared to, you know, where necessarily you want to go for the next technological kind of advancement, right? For the next level of quality to just be the norm. And I bring this up specifically because of the fact that we get a lot of commentary about, well, you know, we want 422 chroma subsampling, but we want HEVC because you want the better, the higher quality compression that HEVC brings, the smaller file sizes, and technically the better image quality. And I'll leave that up to people who are way more skilled at determining the quality differences between the two. But the general consensus is that H.265 can give you a better looking noise profile or better looking noise profile at a given bit rate and ISO compared to H.264 at the same ISO and bit rate and then compared again to things like ProRes at a really high bit rate all because of the way that the compression is handled and how it it handles noise. Um, but specifically when it comes to H.265 uh, or HEVC, if you're looking in and you're, you know, you're kind of just getting in trying to figure all of this stuff out, HEVC is, while still a relatively new compression when it comes to capture, it is an incredibly powerful uh, capture compression for cameras. The only challenge that you run into really comes down to the hardware that you're using to edit your footage. Uh, a lot gets said about how, well, you know, I have an M1 Mac and it, it just chews through this without a problem. And well, okay, maybe it can. It's not necessarily gonna be able to do that on a much higher, larger scale. When you're working with a ton of different, you know, kind of video layers and edits and, um, you know, graphics being overlaid and all that kind of stuff. It's much easier to bog your, your camera down or your computer down when you're working with a much higher compressed piece of footage because the computer now has to handle the decompression of that, the frame interpretation of it, um, all of that processing to be able to let you work on it. Now, one of the ways that we mitigate this, at least on our side, is we use the most commonly used uh, hardware supported version of HEVC, and that is 420 10-bit. Um, what this means is that if you've worked on a Mac, if you've worked on a modern PC computer, you probably have zero problems working with HEVC because 420 10-bit is hardware decodable. Um, for those that haven't really worked too much in the computer side of this, what that means is that your CPU doesn't have to do the decoding, your graphics card can assist and take that load away, 
which means that your programs don't slow down, your uh, graphic overlays, your uh, cuts, all that kind of stuff that you add into that, don't get bogged down because it's sharing the processing with the CPU. Now Macs make this a little bit easier because if you're working in Final Cut or if you're working in Premiere or any program that's designed to optimize the M1 support, um, it's made it a little bit easier, but it still is a minority in the kind of proliferation of those computers, even in the much higher end space. Because you have to remember the vast majority of people aren't updating computers every year. You're updating a computer, you're using it, and I see this on the forums all the time. And if you go into the Facebook groups and you just do like a five minute search, you'll see how many people are asking, hey, this is the computer I have. Is this good enough to you know, edit 4K or 6K footage out of a camera? So even with graphics cards, if we look on the PC side of this, even with graphics cards that are you know, pushing five, six years old, 420 10-bit is a uh, hardware decodable uh, format. So you're not really gonna have a problem with it. At that point, you run into memory and, and other aspects. So with our camera, the 6K, that is one of the reasons why it is in 420 10-bit. It's usability, it's being able to take that and pretty much throw it on any piece of so uh, hardware that you're using computer-wise that's been out, I would safely say, within the last five years. And you really shouldn't have that big of an issue to edit with it. Where it really comes into play is with much older uh, hardware. If you're, you know, working on a computer that you've had for 10 years and you've been like piecemeal updating it, you may run into a little bit of challenges with it. But ultimately, our goal with the combination of the compression, the bit rate, the uh, chroma subsampling, and the bit depth is all based around what is commonly available and easy for you to work with in post. So when we get the question, well, you know, but 422 10-bit in HEVC, I need that chroma subsampling. I, to start with, I'd ask, do you really? Um, when you account for where your footage is being delivered, all the stuff that you're gonna be doing to it in post, uh, whether how heavy or how light that is, are you really gonna notice it? Um, and the reason I bring that up is we've done a number of pieces that are done by high-end production houses and high-end colorists that are able to take our 420 footage, our 422 footage, the ProRes footage, mix them all together and get them to look you know, great with each other. So. I think the, the, the point that I would wanna make here is that you have choices in this camera. You have a ton of capabilities and a ton of flexibility for pretty much everything that you wanna do with it. The thing that comes down is that there is a point where you can have too many options that actually make it more complicated and make it harder for you to figure out well, where is the problem coming from? Where is the challenge that I'm having? Why is this bogging my computer down when I made one little change and now all of a sudden it doesn't want to work right? We take a lot of that in, you know, to heart basically. You know, we want to make sure that when you click the record button, when you throw this on your MacBook, when you throw this on your PC, that you're able to take this footage and just start working with it and not have to worry about transcoding, not have to worry about, you know, do I have the right hardware? It's all to maximize the longevity that you have to work with, not necessarily just the camera, but the equipment that you use to edit the footage. Um, all of this being said, you also run into the whole commentary about, well, which is better, HEVC, H.264, ProRes, um, ProRes RAW, Blackmagic RAW, since we have those on these cameras. And it really just goes down to the choice of what you're working on. S5 Mark II X has the ability to record in all of those, those formats, HEVC, H.264 with 422 10-bit. Um, you have the ability to do all intra IPB in H.264. You have the ability to do ProRes, HQ and non-HQ. Um, and when we get the question, well, well why don't you have you know, ProRes, um, uh, whatever the smaller one is, you know, why, why don't you have the, the basic Resonant. Well, it's because bitrate wise, it's about the same as what our 600 megabit to 800 megabit all injure can do on the S5 Mark II X anyway. Uh, and they cut just the same, you know, depending on whatever software you use. So there's actually no benefit to have um, ProRes 422LT 
in the camera versus our all intra option. Um, and when they cut, they're pretty much, you really can't tell the difference between them. So know that you've got plenty of choices. You've got tons of different ways that you can record your content on the camera. The S5 Mark II X allows you to do both to the SD cards for backup, relay, um, allocation recording. You have the ability to do SSD recording should you want to go down that route. There's the ProBlade SSDs in combination with the Condor Blue handle. There's options like the Samsung T5s, the uh, E81 and E61s from SanDisk. You've got plenty of storage options out there, all depending on what your you know, kind of rig looks like. And I would, I would say to everybody that's looking at this, especially because there's a lot of new people uh, joining the forums that are joining into Lumix Live here that are asking us these questions, try to understand what every what a person's perspective is when they're looking to get into this camera, when they're asking questions about it. That's what we try to do here. I would I I'm never gonna tell anybody, hey, record in this mode with these settings, and that's gonna get you the best thing. Because truth is for you, for me, yeah, sure, it might work, but for that other person, it may not be the appropriate settings for it. It may not even be the right quality for it. You know, anyone that wants to record ProRes RAW versus Blackmagic RAW, anyone that likes to, to edit in Premiere like myself or Resolve like the vast majority of, of everybody else, you know, there are just those various different choices that all work well for us. And when you look at what our cameras are designed to do, especially in the video sense, that's why they're designed this way. They're designed so that whatever software, whatever style that you shoot in, you've got a tool that will work pretty much in any case that you want to throw the camera into. Um, the caveats being there, like if you're someone who, sh you know, edits in Avid, well, you're probably going to need an external recorder for that if you want to record in DNX, but that's such a, even a, a smaller subseg, you know, subsection of what most of us are ever doing. So... Yeah, to, to round this out, you know, we took a look at, you know, what, what the camera has internally, and open gate is really one of the biggest, you know, kind of points there. Again, I, I can't stress enough how valuable open gate is for video capture, and it's because of that fact that even though you may be pushing back against vertical video, if you shoot your projects and capture your content in open gate, and we know that the vast majority of people are delivering in either 24 or 30p, 60p is used for slow-mo, at least in the United States, you have, you, you have a camera that means you don't have to change how you capture as a creative. Shoot in open gate, Drop it on a 16 by 9 timeline, scale it however you want, punch in however you want, zoom, pan, whatever you want to do with it. But know that I, I can very easily, with just dropping that footage on a different timeline, changing the sequence timeline on it, I have all of my deliveries with the same piece of content. So you're saving time in production, you're saving time in the actual shoot, and you're saving time in post because all you got to do is edit it once. And then if you're like me in Premiere, I'll edit, I'm going to edit this entire thing in a 16 by 9 so that I can load it on YouTube. But I also know that I'm going to need to be making vertical cuts out of this for our TikTok, for Instagram, send over to our agency, stuff like that. Well, I'm just going to take a vertical uh, project of it after all the edits I've done and just export out a vertical cut of this because I've got my frame markers up. I know how I'm framed. Now, luckily, I'm center framed, but it makes it that much easier. So I encourage you to play around, try these things. If you haven't shot an open gate, just give it a shot. You'd be surprised at how flexible the, the footage from this camera is. Yeah, it's not 422, but if you're in a situation where you need 422, I argue you're probably really not gonna notice the difference here unless you're doing really high-end like keying work. And even then, I'd argue that the delivery that you're gonna be giving to your client probably not going to see the difference. So yeah, that kind of does it for this week. I know it's a little bit shorter, a little more sweet, uh, short, sweet, and to the point. Um, I will be uh, recording the next stream uh, at my next uh, location as I am uh, traveling a little bit here. I am on vacation for uh, the next two weeks, so next week's stream will be recorded as well. Uh, and we're going to be actually going over the S5 Mark IIx as a travel camera. 
Um, I'm going to cover over some of the things that I packed away for my uh, two weeks trip here, driving cross country, um, some of the content that I'm creating, and the fact that I'm using this camera as a true hybrid camera. Walking around the, the streets of New York with it today as a photography tool, recording Lumix Live with it tonight as a video tool, uh, and then just documenting uh, my, my trip cross country. So. Um, if you haven't already, hit like, hit subscribe. It helps us out with this channel. If you like this content, if you want to hear more about specifics that we talked about in this uh, video, drop a comment down below. Um, that one, it helps the algorithm. It helps us all of that fun stuff. Um, but two, it also helps me, you know, understand, you know, what parts of the things that we talk about do you want to hear more about? What do you want me to go more in depth with? Um, what areas do I need to bring in experts who know way more than I do about certain topics? Um, yeah, so drop a comment, um, let us know what you think about the, uh, the S5 Mark II X. Uh, let us know in the comments too, uh, if, if you've got an S5 Mark II X, if you've, if you've pre-ordered one, if you're an S5 Mark II user, or even if you're a, an S5 or an S1 series owner, let us know, uh, you know, what, what you like about the cameras, what you want to see in future cameras. Um, all of those things help us, uh, you know, as, as we move through the next uh, iterations of our products. As I said, this is the new phase for Lumix, so there's a lot of exciting stuff coming. Uh, and with that, as I said, we'll be back with another recorded stream next Thursday at 2 p.m. Um, thanks for tuning in and all of your comments and the love that you guys show for, for Lumix and the platform. And uh, yeah, hope you have an awesome rest of your weekend. Take care.